what I'd like to do in the next just a few minutes is basically to provide the scientific support for, for Toby's introduction here and, uh, you know, provide the ample evidence we have of the crisis we're in, the urgency, the need to move in transformative exponential pathways along what we call the carbon law, which um, we in the scientific community increasingly conclude means that we really need the global 100 type momentum. We need to have role models of climate club actors, what I call keystone actors, showing not only at the frontier of what is possible, but also showing the benefits, the multiple benefits that you derive from, from that journey. We came to Glasgow following a pathway to disaster. Scientifically, this was well established. We were at best ending up at a 2.7 degrees Celsius global mean temperature rise by the end of this century, a place we haven't been in for the past four to five million years, potentially across the two degrees Celsius point, triggering multiple irreversible catastrophic tipping points that would basically commit all future generations to a potentially unmanageable future. We left Glasgow after a number of updates of NDCs, 90% uh, of global emissions being connected to net zero pathways, an unprecedented methane pledge, an unprecedented 130 trillion US dollar financial alignment by Mark Carney et al, and a very significant pledge on deforestation towards a pathway to danger, meaning that we go from disaster to danger if we deliver on everything we promised in Glasgow, we can hold just the two degrees Celsius mark, the warmest temperature on Earth over the past three million years. So we still have work to do. Just as Toby says, we've taken a big step forward. I would even argue we've turned a corner towards you know, the beginning of the end of the fossil fuel era. You represent to a large extent the most important drivers of that change, but there's still a lot to do. As Toby pointed out, yes, the global emissions are still rising, which is a big concern because the IPCC shows clear that the remaining global carbon budget is such a little sliver. It's up to, you know, maximum four or five hundred billion tons of carbon dioxide to hold at a 66 percent probability the 1.5 degrees Celsius line. We emit 40 billion tons per year, so we have less than 10 years left in current level of emissions, which means that this is the decisive decade. It's not the decade when we fall over a cliff, but it's the decade that will determine where we'll, whether we'll be able to hold the 1.5 degrees Celsius mark. And I can tell you, not only from the IPCC, but from the battery of scientific evidence that is being published, has been published, and is in the pipeline, that we have more and more unequivocal scientific evidence that 1.5 is a true climate planetary boundary. Can we hold it? We have a good chance of avoiding crossing tipping points. We go beyond it and we enter a danger zone. So 1.5 is not only a political choice, it is a scientific necessity. How come? Well, it's because we have more and more science of this kind. We know of roughly 15 big tipping point system in the earth system that we know not only regulate the climate system, but also have multiple stable states separated by tipping points. This is the latest assessment of the nine of those 15 that are showing signs of instability, meaning that they're showing a signs of approaching tipping points. But not only that, the arrows here are fundamental. We have more and more scientific evidence <clears throat> that's what's happening very fast in the Arctic Sea and ice melt and Greenland. We have a, a warming amplification with up to twice as high warming in the Northern Hemisphere than the global average is slowing down the overturning of heat in the North Atlantic, impacting on the monsoons over the Amazon rainforest, which can explain the higher frequency of fires and droughts, and the fact that the Brazilian part of the Amazon has already tipped over from being the world's single largest important terrestrial carbon sink to now being a carbon source. But it's also holding more surface water in the Southern Ocean, which can explain the accelerated melting in the West Antarctic ice shelf. We call this cascades. We have to keep an eye on this, and this is why we have launched the carbon law, meaning what's the path that we need to follow to keep the whole Earth system stable, staying within planetary boundaries? Well, one rule is shown here in gray, which is on fossil fuel phase out, 
we need to follow the carbon law inspired by the Moore's law, which goes as follows, cut emissions by half every decade, and we follow the innovation pathway that can give us a net zero world economy by mid-century. That is the pace of innovation transformation that we need to see on fossil fuels. But that's not enough. We need a food system transition from source to sink, shown here in the brown to orange wedge. And we need to keep all the carbon sinks in nature intact, shown here in green for land and blue in the ocean. And not even that is enough. We also need to start scaling negative emission technologies, shown in orange. So what we're facing over the next 10 to 20 years is a global sustainability transition to have a safe landing. That is what is at stake. And what you represent, again, is really the social tipping point of being able to make this journey inevitable, meaning the safe landing being the pathway towards a safe and just prosperous and equitable future for humanity. And I think the Global 100, you represent a really incredibly important part of that journey.